Welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries. I am David Lizerbram here with my co-host Andrew Keats. And uh, today is uh, another one of our little special in between seasons episodes where we are going to each count down our top 20 of the rock docs that we've reviewed. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're going to rank the 20 movies that we have discussed on this show. Each of us. We're not ranking the 20 episodes of the show. <laughs> that would be <laughs> all number one. Too, too navel gazy, <laughs> even for us. We're, we're talking about the movies themselves. Yes, this is a classic podcast move where they then go back and talk about rank something. Um, so yeah. this is not an original. It's also a classic sitcom move. Sure, it's like a clip show. It's like a clip show, yeah. Did you ever see the uh, the the Clerks animated series that briefly ran on uh, Comedy Central before Kevin Smith totally gave up on his career? Yeah, wasn't there like six episodes of the whole series, and one of them was a clip show, which they aired second, <laughs> and all of and all of the clips were from the first episode. It's actually a pretty good bit. It's a pretty good bit. Solid bit. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I actually read an article yesterday that was like reconsidering Chasing Amy, and it's actually good. And I was like, okay, this kind of makes sense. Because I feel like Chasing Amy was like popular at the time. And then this is a whole different other podcast that's also less good yeah. than our podcast. So, But anyway. I don't, I don't want to turn too many of our listeners against me. But I'm here to say Chasing Amy was always good. Okay. Well, uh, you know, we'll uh, link to that article or something. Anyway. Um, so Andy and I have not compared each other's lists. I don't know what his number one is or number 20 or anything else, vice versa. Before we get to that, though, Andy, there's a little news I have to share with you. I'm not sure if you saw this. Uh, we recently got our first bad review on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, I did not hear this. Because okay, that's I'm excited. I'm excited to hear this. All right, great. People, we just got our first bad review on Apple Podcasts, and here I'm going to read it to you now. <laughs> I feel like All we right, made great. it now Thank that we you. got a bad review. So this is it. That's great. I wish we had more. Yeah. Uh, two stars. So not no, not one, but two stars. Okay. <laughs> And the title of the review is and um and um and um and the copy of the review is and um and um and um. Fair like, enough. I guess we're the one podcast where people say um sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Busted. Uh fair enough. That's fine. Good. Hit me with it. That's fine. I respect that though. Uh please yeah. review our podcast. <laughs> Whatever. We'll take constructive criticism or even that kind of criticism. That's fine. Um I don't know. I'm kind of proud. It's kind of a badge of honor. Yeah. He's right. We say and, and um sometimes. It's fine. Yeah, it's, it's f- we could edit it out. Yeah, if we had. I may quibble like with thousand dollars. I, I quibble more with the number <laughs> of stars than the uh, actual commentary, but sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So now, uh, we are going to uh, reverse order rank our favorite of the twenty, uh, rock docs that we have reviewed thus far on this podcast. We now are very clear on what the concept is. Uh, yes. Andrew. Would you like to go first? Yeah. You're number 20. Yep. My 20th ranked podcast was fairly easy for me. Kind of a slam dunk. I think it's it might get loud. Okay. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to say, like, um, we don't have to like break every single one down, but like I feel like number 20 requires an explanation. Yeah. So It Might Get Loud was a uh, Davis Guggenheim film about the three guitar gods, The Edge, Jack White, and Jimmy Page, and they were convened for a guitar summit yeah. that did not elicit much, and so instead of that, they sort of made mini profiles of each of the three guys and didn't really bother to draw any thematic elements between them. But we had a great talk about it with uh, with Molly and Chris. Fun episode. Yeah, had a great time talking about it. Um, made made for good content yeah. as far as uh, as far as on the secondary on the on the secondary content market. Um, so it's, you know it's in the in the music world. You know the, the Ticketmaster version of it not great, but on StubHub it really shined. Okay. Um, so yeah. A- anyway, what what uh what what do you what did you have at number twenty? I uh did not I did not like it. Might get loud. <laughs> You'll it, okay. it's way down on my list. But yeah. uh, my number but 20, 20, my number 20, yeah. and Andy, I got to tell you, I'm not doing this at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But I, 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 I actually wasn't adequately prepared for this. I, I can't believe it. I, oh, man. My, listeners know we have a commitment to radical honesty and transparency on this podcast. That's what we're known for. Yeah. And I got to be honest. Wow. 
My least favorite of the 20 movies we saw was Bittersweet Motel. That is your least favorite movie that we have watched <laughs> out have of to be 20 films. Man. It's not good uh, on any level. As long as we're both being honest, let me just say that this hurts me. <laughs> that I'm hurt. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm Again, this, you're not the target of this. this. Yeah. I wrestled with this, but I gotta okay. be honest with you. Uh, this is a movie about fish. Not particularly a fan, but they come off... The music is okay. The music is not the part that I disliked by far the most about this movie. That's the yeah. music is way down on the list of things I didn't uh, like about this movie. Frankly, I take your reaction to the music as like a a, a victory, not even a small victory, just a, like a straight victory. Yeah, uh, but it's a total brick for me <laughs> as a movie. <laughs> it's not good. Uh, there's Trey waving a gun around for some reason yeah. that didn't come off well. Uh, it do, like Todd Phillips, the director's approach to the movie is just sort of like annoying and distant and weird and um it left a bad taste in my mouth <laughs> and i i i mean if you're a hardcore fish fan please enjoy this movie i do not want to take that away from anybody i don't have any judgment about that i did not i do not look forward to ever seeing this movie again in my life <laughs> well i revel in what i did with my ranking here for for bittersweet motel we'll we'll just have to to tease the fact that it's higher than 20 <laughs> It's higher than twenty. Okay. It's higher than twenty, and I, 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 I played with the right place to put it, um, based on your searing feedback during the episode. But I, I had to be honest with myself, and I had to to look into my soul and to, you know, my soul. That's a that's a fish reference for, for okay. everybody out there. Sure. I uh, okay. I had to, I had to to do what was was true for me and. We'll get to it, but uh, sorry, it Peter Jackson, point. you're not touching that number one spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So I knew no we'd me. have it. I knew we would not land the same place on that one. All right. Uh, maybe we're uh, more in line now. Uh, do you? Should we do snake draft, or are we? Are we doing? No, we'll just go back. All right, back. you go. You go. All right. Number nineteen for me was uh, once we're brothers. Yeah. And I adore the band. Yeah. This is a a documentary about the band. Uh, Robbie Robertson and the band. Robbie Robertson and the band (laughs) Um, came out in 2020. And look, there's actually one thing I'll say about this is there's a lot of good stuff in that movie. And if you listen back to that episode, I did not have an especially negative review of it. In fact, one thing that this exercise has taught me is that I'm pretty positive about all of these movies. I think I just like Rock Docs, which makes the premise of this show sensible yeah with like um, really maybe one or two exceptions all these movies i liked yes on some so level. uh so once we're brothers i i, I think r- just has some significant flaws as a movie however it's still about the band it's still about the members of the band it's still about bob dylan in large large part and it's like expertly produced the the people who are who who are making this movie know how to make a movie they just sort of lacked significant inspiration in some way. And so um, there's a lot in it that salvages it that I would still recommend it to a lot of people. But on the whole, not a great film and even potentially problematic in some ways in the way that it it skates past some of the controversies around the band. Yeah, I feel like that's a movie where uh, much as we always want more, if you took <laughs> that movie and edited about 10 minutes of Robbie Robertson's blathering out of the movie, it would probably yeah. move up on the list. Like if you did not <laughs> add anything and you only eliminated some of it, some Robbie Robertson it, navel gazing. W- one one note, change the title from Once We're Brothers to just Robbie Robertson and the band. Sure. And remove any element of him screwing around in the studio with his... 2020 single once we're brothers <laughs> that we all summer song of the summer <laughs> <laughs> you we've you've just bought yourself 10 minutes that absolutely no one will miss you know how um in half half of the rock talks we've seen somebody ends up singing the the song the weight <laughs> which <laughs> is, is a robbie robertson <laughs> composition that is great yeah um, are we gonna are, nobody's gonna are make we gonna a run rock, nobody's gonna do their rendition of once we're brothers <laughs> on future no rock absolutely not yeah are we that that's something we have to keep tabs on in season three. Are are we going to continue running into people covering the weight? Is that is that is that going to be a recurring motif? I think that was a season two phenomenon where 
four of the ten movies we uh, reviewed involve people covering the weight. I think we might, you know, it might pop up again, but I I think that was just a unique confluence of events. Okay. Uh, Well, my number 19 is It Might Get Loud. Uh, As we've discussed, this is a a garbage movie. (laughs) (laughs) It's not good. Um, uh, And, um, yeah, it also, you know... It also has that vibe of a vanity project, much like Once for Brothers. A vanity project doesn't mean it has to be bad, but it's really... It, the vanity in this case seems to be the director, Davis Guggenheim, just kind of thinking, like, anything I do with these guys is going to be great. We're all yeah, so yeah. good, and I've got this great crew. I'm sure everybody involved was super talented and, like, top of their game yeah. that we're just going to, like, show up and jam, and it's going to rock, and it did not... I don't need a winning premise. I don't, you know, I don't need great archival footage. All I need is my camera and these three guys, and this baby is going to sing. Yeah, and it really did not. Okay, so that's, uh, <laughs> I don't know how much more I need to slam on uh, It Might Get Loud. So, okay. But I got to say, if you've skipped it, go check out that episode. We had a great time. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> it is. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. The purpose yeah. of this podcast is not for us to dunk on movies we don't like, it's in fact to celebrate yeah. movies we do. Um, and try to. Just, and in fact, and I didn't. I couldn't even. I couldn't even bring myself to like not recommend that movie. I still went <laughs> sideways, thumbs. <laughs> yeah. Um. Really, we're here to celebrate movies we like and to discover new ones and uh, yeah. to uh, appreciate the art form. Uh, it might get loud. Is uh not good. Okay. Um. All right. Shall we? So move? eighteen 18. for me. Eighteen. Eighteen for me was uh, Woodstock '99. And. I think Woodstock 99 is slick and it's kind of a fun watch. And I, I think I would recommend it to quite a, a, a lot of people. And I, I didn't hate it by any stretch of the imagination. But what, what we eventually arrived at on that episode about it being like a think piece more than it was a rock documentary is where I stand on it right now, especially on its rewatchability. That I, I, I don't have any desire really to rewatch or spend a lot of time dissecting a movie that's kind of feels like a, a, a essay. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I didn't rank it super high, um, mainly because the music is butt and <laughs> I don't really, you know, it's sort of the opposite. That's the other thing. There's not, there's not a lot of like, well, I'm not in cra- I'm not crazy about this music, but, or excuse me, I'm not crazy about this movie, but there's going to be three minutes of this song right now that I'm really into. So that salvages it. There's not much of that in that. Right. It's like the reverse of Once We're Brothers, where like, you know, in the Once We're or, Brothers, the music is phenomenal. Um, but or the surround- Bittersweet Motel, which we both agree con- conclusively as a team <laughs> is fantastic music by a seminal rock band that belongs in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but maybe is a flawed film. There's parts of that that I agree with. <laughs> I certainly think they should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's no doubt. Our it's ro- dumb that they should, they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's ob- I'm a big Hall guy, though. You know. Yeah. So, um, okay. but yeah, there's there's no question. I'll- Fish should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So should Iron Maiden. There's a lot. There's a long list. I mean, we can just yeah, sure. you know, uh, that's a whole other podcast. Okay. <clears throat> um, but yeah, Woodstock '99, uh, not enjoyable for the music. But I mean, we got a lot of good conversation out of our you know talk with Garrett Price, the director, about it. I think there's a lot there. But yeah, that episode. The rewatchability True. aspect of it is on the low side just because it's like a thing you're like, okay, that's interesting. It made me think about something, but I'm not looking to go back to it just as a hang. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like a, like a VH1 behind the music type deal or something like that. Okay. Uh, All right, what do you have at 18? At 18, I have Once for Brothers. Uh, we just kind of okay. um, mm-hmm. kicked that one in the teeth for a little while, so I don't know that we need to kind of reiterate. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You know, again, uh, at the low end, uh, you know, most of these spots you could flip-flop and just say, okay, well, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, just uh, I, I wanted to rank it higher just because of the music alone. We're like, really, if it's, on, it's, it's almost like a better background movie than Foreground, Once for Brothers. Like if it's on in the background, mm-hmm. you're just gonna get great music and occasionally some yeah, talking exactly. and you know, and like and cool footage. Yeah, you know, car cool, crashes, cool old photos and shit. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, it it does not stand up to the light of day. Okay, so right. uh, seventeen. This is a, I think this is a surprising one, but I this is where I started to like figure out what I was doing with my list, and I ended up with a hybrid of movies I thought I would rewatch the most for the rest of my life. Right. Music that I really liked. Mm -hmm. And like things that I recognized as 
good films apart from whatever my musical tastes or watching habits are. Okay. Um, and so I went with 17 Buena Vista Social Club. Same. 17. Interesting. Okay. 17. Yeah. Okay. All right. 17. So I do think this is a good movie and I do think that this is an interesting premise and I think like I don't buy into for the most part a lot of the problematizing of Ry Cooter um, having a sort of white savior complex around these Cuban musicians. I think for the most part, he has elevated these musicians in a beneficial way for Cuban culture and that the movie itself is good. However, it's long. It's a little tedious. Um, they do lean too much on Ry Cooter. Ry Cooter is in the movie too much. Yeah. And um, I, I think it's sort of... Uh, my defense of it notwithstanding, it, it hasn't aged especially great because of how prevalent Ry Cooter is in it. And I just don't think he needs to be, really. I, th- I think the movie would have been perfectly fine with less of him. Um, and I, I think all of that combines to it being less rewatchable than it should be given the subject matter, which is, is pretty exciting, pretty thrilling. And um, so I thank it for introducing me to these musicians. I like it in a lot of ways, but I don't see myself watching it very much for the rest of my life. Uh, yeah, I mean, the music is tremendous, but you can listen to the music separately. It doesn't really mm-hmm. hang together as a movie. Uh, it looks really bad. It just looks like garbage. And I, I don't know if yeah. like a better transfer would really save it because it seems like it was shot on really bad videotape. And I guess any medium, somebody could, you know, with a good eye, um, could turn that into something visually compelling. And you've got Wim Vendors, the director, and Robbie Mueller, the cinematographer, who did tremendous work <laughs> on other films. So there's no reason why it should be, it should look like this. There's just something really sloppy and tossed off about it. I think it doesn't give the musicians what they deserve in a way. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's just, you know, it's it, it was disappointing to go back to this years later. Because uh, it was such a phenomenon. Yeah. This is like one of the, the, the handful of movies that we have covered that were phenomenons either recently or in their time. Yeah. And the, the, and and this one is a little bit surprising that it doesn't hold up better, but just based on how popular it was. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so we're tied for 17. Uh, 16, Andy. 16. And this one maybe will come to a surprise because I think I was pretty universally uh, complimentary of it during our episode, but... This is where I came down on it. The Upsetter. Our, our, our old friend Lee Scratch Perry. Ooh, okay. All right. Um, I think that it is it is a unique trip into the mind of a of a person who has a unique mind. Okay. And I value that. I know a lo- quite a bit about Lee Scratch Perry now that I, you know, I didn't know before, and it's a very compelling watch because of that. Um, but as much as when I defended their creative choice not to include any other Talking Heads, there are no other musicians, there are no other people, there are no principals interviewed in this movie except for Lee Scratch Perry, and I like that decision. But I do find myself now thinking that like. I would have liked to have heard more of what other people have to say about Lee Scratch Perry. And I really, really strongly dislike the entire section with the guy in the kitsch store in San Francisco. Hmm. Like that alone takes it like a whole grade down in my book. Um, So we're we're comfortably now into the er area of films that I like. Um, So that, that includes this movie. And uh, Lee Scratch Perry has been so uh, a steady part of my rotation since this movie came through our transom. Um, however, this is this is where I come down here. The upsetter number 16. All right. I went a little higher with that one. So maybe we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, my number 16 was Woodstock 99. Kind of similar, mm-hmm. you know, like we said, um, you know, again, not a knock on the movie, um, but uh, we've got 20 uh <laughs> approximately 17 really good movies here <laughs> and somebody's yeah, got to yeah. be near the bottom of the list and so um so that's where uh that's where that is all right 
Um, we already discussed that one. Let's do 15. Zappa. Okay. Um, hmm. Now, this is this is your bittersweet motel. You're, you're a Zappa guy, a well-known Zappa guy. And the, the thing I keep coming back with this movie, I just didn't get enough of Zappa's music. I feel like I spent an awful lot of time learning about Zappa's politics, which frankly are less interesting to me than Zappa's music. And I really liked what I heard of Zappa's music. And I was really interested and invested throughout the first half of this movie in the discussion of who Zappa was as a guy, how that manifested in his music and how outside the norm it was for music in the late 60s and 70s and into the 80s. And while I guess it is true that it makes that his politics and his um, sort of you know, investment in free speech make him a unique guy in the history of music, none of it really stands out as especially compelling now, years later. Um, his his sort of defense of free speech and fighting against the parental advisory label kind of seems like old hat. Um, his uh, forays into the uh, you know sort of fall of the USSR seem pretty typical, um, and so. And and they didn't. They don't all seem to have amounted to very much in the end either. It's not like he could be said to have had a significant impact. I don't think. And so uh, the the director of that film, who I think did a, a really good job, and I'm very in, interested in the story around the film and everything that the creation of the film did to cement Zappa's legacy and to archive his work. But I think the the creator, the director there, was a little bit too interested in Zappa's outside music life, and and should have just spent more time on Zappa, the visionary musician. All right, again, I went way higher with Zappa, obviously, so we'll discuss that at that point. But I'm d- mm-hmm. just for the purpose of keeping score, uh, Bittersweet Motel better movie than Zappa is still where you stand. <laughs> We're not even close <laughs> to Bittersweet Motel yet. This is great. This is such a good <laughs> bit. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, number 15, I have hype. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is getting to the point where like there are all these movies are good on some level, uh, and, uh, you know, not to be a knock on it, uh, just didn't really stick with me quite as much. There's definitely moments I remember and elements that I enjoyed. Um, but, um, you know, I enjoyed our conversation about it. I, you know, if you threw on that movie, I would enjoy it again. Um, but it just kind of like came and went for me a little bit. Like, whereas some of these other movies, like I have fond memories, you know, we did an episode about it six months ago and I still think about it a lot or, you know, pops up in my head. Or I'm like, oh, we should watch that again. Hype just doesn't live that way for me. And, uh, you know, it's it, it's very good for what it is. It's got some great performances, some interesting bits. But other than the uh, guy who um, slices up the old uh, concert posters <laughs> for performative purposes, uh you know, there's just not a whole lot that really sticks in the memory with that one. That's interesting. Yeah. So I, I, I have hype just a little bit higher here. Um, I have watched it a couple times since we did the episode. So it has stuck with me and I, I do like it. Um, I've also found myself getting, uh, extending my listening a little bit deeper into the, the grunge seen than it was before having seen that movie and so i credit it with that to a certain extent or i credit our conversation with jeff and candace uh combined with the film for that a little bit the one thing i'll say about that movie that i really like that we talked about during the episode is the sort of like pre-commercial documentary era yeah how much it feels like um like a like a PBS product or yeah. like a like you know um these like really long talking head segments um the lack of quick cuts yeah um and it, it's just so different than everything else that we watched and and kind of grounds it a little bit and makes it seem uh less pretentious is maybe one way to put it yeah that 
that I that I really enjoy uh, about it. Uh, also, is it's just something it has going for it. I think that whole scene is very interesting, and I think that its depiction of that scene. We talked about this on the show as well. Like, I I think is a useful um, corrective to all the people who regard the Gen X early '90s grunge scenes disposition towards capitalism or commercialism or careerism as misguided, youthful uh, naivete, and and shows it as as actually quite aware and quite knowing and 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 makes them seem much smarter than they were ever depicted of in popular culture and i think that's that's one thing that that movie really really sticks with me that it's it's like no these are smart interesting people yeah okay um 14 uh, i have hype so okay you well, just yeah, heard what i have go. to say about okay. that one <laughs> next okay uh, for some reason, this was the turn for me where yeah. it's getting harder. It's getting harder, yeah, okay. Like, you know, between the top, whatever, two or three movies, like, you could kind of pick one and whatever. They're all great. Uh, the bottom ones, obviously, we agree are all terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, this is where it's starting to get, like, okay, it's going to sound like a diss to put this movie at number yeah. 14, and it's not intended to be a diss when I say Festival yeah. Express was my 14. Ooh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I like it again. Uh, I feel like, you know, in retrospect, and we just talked about it, you know, very recently, but, um, in terms of recording our episode about it very recently, uh, I just feel like it's a little light. Um, I feel like, um, you know, maybe there is more to be found there, uh, in terms of the footage or something that you can make something a little bit more substantial out of it. Uh, you know, there's great performances by the band and got it. And got it. My voice is right. Yeah. Um, that was dope that they were awesome. there. Guided by Moses <laughs> with her. Yeah. Probably could. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, the Grateful Dead. Uh, and, um, certainly Janice Joplin. Sure. Of course. Buddy Guy. Uh, yeah. Sean Anna. Um, Sean and, Anna. um, yeah. yeah, but there's also some stuff that's not great. Uh, you know, the stuff of them hanging on the bus on the, on the train is, uh, you know, entertaining. Um, and it's great. It's good hang. Um, but again, just a little light and I'm just not sure. I know you, this is like one that is just injected straight into your veins. I'm again, not a knock on that, but, um, maybe if I had seen it when I was 22 or something and like it just been, had been part of my maturation or something, uh, I would have loved it, but catching it at my advanced age, (laughs) I think maybe, uh, you know, I kind of, uh, caught it too late or something. I don't know, but it's, yeah, fair enough. I don't know that yeah, that no, was going to stick with me. Yeah, that's interesting. No, th- this is a uh, absolutely uh, seminal film in my life. There are probably not more than ten or fifteen movies of any genre that I've seen more than it. Uh, I adore it, and even on latest rewatch, still swoon over the the, the train footage, over the incredible live footage from 1970 of the band and Grateful Dead, two of my favorite bands. Um, Some of the stuff with Jerry interacting with Janice is just like incredible to me. The, some of the stuff with Jerry being like a, a a leader. Jerry is, as like this endowed person who's going to speak for all the musicians to the fans is surreal to me in some ways, knowing how Jerry felt about those sorts of things. Um, the like the the role of rock ducks just being a place where people tell bar stories to each other about music i feel like is like very rarely as well done as it is here people are just like you know the the ken walker the promoter is clearly views himself as a fanciful storyteller and is willing to embellish a little bit to make the story better and i think it works and uh, so I'm just all in. This is uh, much higher to me than than this. We'll, we'll get there eventually, but uh, but I understand where you're coming. I from. I think it's an essential piece of the Grateful Dead cinematic universe. 
Yes. So like if totally. you're w- I, I agree if you're that. way bought into like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I could totally see where you're like, well, you need to watch the uh, you know, the 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 Falcon and the Winter Soldier show because it really ties things together and some characters come back and it's gonna pay off later. Um who, who told you you could skip Ant Man? Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you're not that into it, you know, it's skippable. Uh I think is, mm-hmm. you know, fr- on that level, you know. Um but Fair but, but, but I hear yeah. what you're saying. Um okay, thirteen. Tina. Okay. Which again, I adored. I want to be on the record here. Go back and listen to the episode. I had nothing but positive things to say about it. Um Tina Tina's strength as a movie, it's like incredibly emotionally compelling and honest and uh sort of gripping. But all those things do not add to its rewatchability. Like there are a lot of elements of this movie that are like hard to look at the screen during. And so that really dissuades me from putting it back on again. Um, now that said, cutting against that, cutting in the exact opposite direction is all of the live footage of Ike and Tina on their come up, which is astounding. And as good as any of the live performances we've seen in any of these movies, including what if I can get back, <laughs> including the Beatles, you know, including the Grateful Dead and Festival Express. It's incredible stuff. Um, so I love it. And I think Tina really like is charming and honest and winning and uh, clear eyed about her life in a compelling way that makes for an incredible movie. Um, but I'll just say in like a requiem of her dream sort of way that like there's certain things that may be interesting cinematically that I don't want to see that often. Okay. Um, yeah, we're in the same zone. 13. I had Mavis. Okay. Um, okay. and, uh, again, you know, not a knock, uh, very entertaining watch, incredibly compelling, uh, central person. Um, and, um, you know, just not in the all time great, you know, inner circle, rock doc category um but uh that's not uh to say that it's not fun and good and uh you know all the things we said in the episode we did speaking at i think our episode on mavis is almost as long as the movie (laughs) because we were just going on and on about all the things we loved about mavis and about uh you know pop staples and all you know smooching with bob dylan and all that great stuff there's a lot of great stuff in this that sticks with me but couldn't really put it any higher than that yeah, the, I mean, the thing about Mavis to me, and I, I think I said some version of this in our episode, is that I'm incredibly compelled by the like low ambition of it. And I, I, I again, I, I think I hesitated to, to stress that I don't mean that as a knock against the film. It's just that the film was content in saying, this is an interesting, smart, important person, and I want to talk about this interesting, smart, and important person this interesting, smart, talented, important person and not try to set it in two otherwise grandiose a, uh, a framing. Yeah. And so, like, I love that about that movie, but it does make it harder to ascend a little bit higher. Yeah. Uh, number 12 for you. The World's a Little Blurry, Billie Eilish. Okay. Um, so I thought this was an incredibly well done movie. I think um, it sort of recontextualized the way I see Billie Eilish and made me far more likely to to like seek out her music and to to uh, organize my listening around her in in, in any sort of way. Um, I think that it also was sort of a lesson in how a modern music documentary created about a pop culture star about uh that with it seems like there was some sort of involvement in the subject in the project itself doesn't need to be just a spawn con uh piece of promotional uh whatever and can still be an interesting film with a clear perspective that breaks new ground and is interesting and, and so um it's maybe not 
too surprising that Billie Eilish, as opposed to any other uh, young pop culture star, is the one that has a great rock documentary. But I think that um, I, th- I think it's I think it's a, a, a useful I think it's a useful text in showing that like just because somebody is young or just because somebody doesn't have a full complete career, just because somebody is is broadly popular doesn't mean that uh, that a documentary not about them needs to be light fair or primarily promotional. Yeah, just as a comparison, I recently threw on the new doc documentary about Olivia Rodrigo which I don't think we're probably going to talk about because it's not really worthwhile. Um, And it's, I mean, I love her album. Uh, I think she's, you know, a really good songwriter, um, very charismatic. Um, The performances in that are good, but it's basically like a music video where she performs all the songs from her album. There's a little bit of talking and a little bit of documentary element, but it's, you know, it's not really much of a movie. Um, Yeah. You know, and um, good for her. Great. But, um, you know, the, the, Billie Eilish movie really shows uh, the ambition that, um, you know, that she has around this. And, um, you know, it's just a different kind of thing. So uh, my number 12 was Tina. So, again, we're kind of in the same zone here with that. Um, She's so great uh, as a speaker. Um, You know, sometimes, you know, I kind of talked about this um, where, like, sometimes, you know, you get the older subject of a documentary talking back about their life and their past. And it's just kind of like they're just either rehashing the same stories they've told a million times or like they're just not playing it straight or they're not really engaged. Uh, the Robbie, they have some sort of angle. You're Robbie Robertson, let's say. Some, yeah. um, and that's just not, I mean, she comes off so well, so yeah. forthright and thoughtful and, and uh, you know, totally engaged and takes the whole concept so seriously. Um, and um, yeah, so, uh that's a uh good one okay uh number 11 uh mavis okay that's why i have mavis yeah um so loved it uh the you know one lasting thing i've got is like man the musical relationships that mavis had over the years like just incredible do you like leave this movie doesn't even get into her relationship with mahalia jackson which we'll we can mention during summer of soul but like Bob Dylan, Levon Helm, Jeff Tweedy, like every time you turn around, Prince, every time you turn around, <laughs> she's working with an absolute stone cold legend. Yeah. And I don't suspect that that is a coincidence. And it's awesome to have all of that stuff in one place. So for people to remember what a incredible musician she is. Okay. At number 11, I have uh, The Upsetter, the Lee Perry documentary, Higher Than You. Oh, wow. Way, way higher. Yeah. Way higher. Uh, and um, I just respect that they got weird with it, which is appropriate for yeah, Lee yeah, Perry. Yeah. They swung for the fences. Uh, they did not try to make a conventional rock doc in any way. Um, we might be talking to one of the directors of this movie coming up soon, uh, unless uh, everything goes haywire. But that's uh, in the works. So <laughs> unless they hear where I ranked it, <laughs> unless they're like, no, yeah. yeah, no, I, 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 I like your ranking here, and I think, I think this is totally defensible. While I have it, have it lower, I think that was something I, I considered because they did, they did uh, work unconventionally, and I think for the most part, it worked. I, I like that movie. Um, yeah, this is not so a movie you're going to recommend yeah. to everybody. Like, this is not yeah, a universally yeah, yeah. beloved, you know, you just want, no matter who it is walking down the street, you tell them to watch this movie. But if you think it's the type of person that's, like, on the wavelength that might enjoy this, this is, like, there's not another one like this. It's weird. Yes. It's wild. Lee Perry himself is just incredibly compelling. And, yeah, there's some stuff that doesn't work great and, you know, things maybe you could have added or whatever. But, like, it's just so cool. It is the coolest. Yeah. Okay, surprise. Sorry for the fake out, but that was part one of uh, Rank the Rock Docs. We went kind of long on this, uh, as you can tell, because it's like almost 40 minutes and we uh, only got through (laughs) the first 10. Um, So, yeah, we decided to break this up uh, for ease of listening. Um, So, yeah, the uh, part two of Rank the Rock Docs will be go from 10 to 1. 
um, is uh, coming up next week. So stay tuned. As always, we can be found at Rock Docs Pod on Instagram and Twitter. And um, yeah, if you uh, have opinions about our rankings so far, please feel free to um, share them, <laughs> good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, both parts have been recorded, so um, it's too late for us to take that into account. But uh, nonetheless, uh, believe that we care. Um, thanks for listening to Rock Docs, and uh, stay tuned next week for part two of Ranking the Rock Docs. <laughs>